Morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series that take place here at the Indurpilli Lecture Theater, as well as online. Uh, my name is Katerina, and myself and Karina are co-chairs of the seminar series, and we're taking turns introducing the speakers and organizing the seminars. Before we begin, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize our valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker today is Professor Ian Satchel, who is an adjunct professor here at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. He is a senior fellow at Perth US Asia Center uh, based at the University of Western Australia, where he specializes in trade and investment analysis and policy. Ian has worked closely with SMI since 2011, when he took up the role of director of the International Mining for Development Center. And this center is a UQ UWA joint venture founded by the Australian government to build capacity in mining governance in developing economies in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Ian and an SMI team have just completed a 17 month long project for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, um, reviewing performance in minerals government governance, I knew I was gonna mess up that word, um, governance cooperation and investment and trade and advising on both content and implementation of the revised ASEAN Minerals Cooperation Action Plan. Um, with his work, in advises business, government, and NGOs on trade, investment, and economic and environmental policy and governance. And today's presentation is on enhancing Australia's leadership in minerals globally. Enhancing Australia's global minerals leadership. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Ian. Thank you very much, Katarina. It's, it's great to be back at SMI after um, an absence of well over two years, I'm not sure what happened, but um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're all back and uh, stop, we've, we've stopped hiding and being in Western Australia, we were, we were especially hidden away. Um, so thank you for that introduction, uh, Katerina. Uh, I, I use uh, LinkedIn um, and I've had a long career in minerals, but it was somewhat sobering um, last year when the uh, best response I had to a LinkedIn post was about my prostate surgery. Um, so something either about my my uh, my age and stage, or or about the the lack of, uh, of of gravitas of my earlier posts on technical matters. Just got to progress this. Uh, here we are. So today um, I'm going to be talking. Uh, about the Australian minerals sector globally. And it's not as well understood as it should be, particularly within the Australian government. Uh, but the Australian minerals sector is not just what exists and uh, operates in Australia, it's actually a formidable global enterprise. And I think people connected with the Sustainable Minerals Institute plus uh, companies really understand that, but I think it can be better understood uh, within government and within civil society. So the Australian mineral sector is present in all of the world's resources regions, and it operates right across the value chain from uh, early stage exploration to mining equipment, technology and services. And by others outside Australia, and I hope within Australia, Australia is seen as a world leader in minerals governance and sustainability. I might say for all of the learning we still have to do and some of the uh, excoriating um, things that can go wrong. Um, there is, as you know, a fast increasing and rapidly changing global demand for minerals and I'll touch on that. Uh, there are growing calls for in stronger international collaboration on supply chains or value chains and in achieving the SDGs through the minerals sector. Um, Australia has, in my contention, commercial drivers and ethical responsibilities to work with other nations 
uh, and global organisations and companies to help those nations, particularly developing nations, do mining well and do well from mining. So I believe the Australian mineral sector and governments uh, should work more closely together to improve sustainability outcomes for the sector and its host uh, jurisdictions globally. We are doing a lot, we can do more. So I've got some references, I've just put that in for, for the record. Um, and some of, some of the references are getting a little bit aged. I had hoped to update some of the data, but um, a certain project was the gift that kept on giving and haven't been able to do that just yet. So first of all, Australia's global minerals interests and a little um, uh, tutorial on, on minerals and general trade and in a moment on investment. So Australia's export interests are dominated by resources. And if you look at the chart uh, on the bottom left, you can see that minerals and energy uh, make up, uh, well, now more than half of Australia's export value. Uh, this is a couple of years old, few years old, but um, it, it's close to that now, but with rising prices, uh, the proportion of exports has risen. I'll just note, uh, talking on a university campus that more than one third of the services sector is made up of education services and related travel. And that's important to understand. So education uh, is number four in Australia's exports um, or until the, uh, until, till the pandemic, but it will, it will recover. If we look across at the, at the map and we see, and there's no surprise here that China dominates uh, our uh, export markets and well, China is also our largest import source um, of, of general goods at least. But it's worth noting that Asia other than China actually uh, has an export value or had an export value in 2018-19 of 200 billion or almost 200 billion. And we also note that the EU, and this is EU with the UK in it, um, it, it is a very significant uh, export destination as well, as is, of course, the US and New Zealand with its five and a half million people. It's a very substantial export market for Australia. Now, investment paints a different picture to trade. And Rory Medcalf of the ANU Security College uh, coined the phrase, uh, Trade is transactional, investment is about relationships. We haven't paid enough attention to outward investment by Australian companies. Other countries like Canada, which competes with Australia for uh, access to um, mineral uh, investment markets, uh, does understand much better. I'll come back to that. But we see that the United States is a very, very large in, uh, investment destination for Australia, as is the UK and the EU pre-Brexit. We add a bit more in France plus Germany and others. And we also see that New Zealand's a major investment destination. Uh, China is relatively small for investment and the ASEAN region is substantially larger than, than China. Uh, as an investment destination. Uh, and this is important to understand when we start to uh, work on public policy and international uh, relationships. Now, outbound investment um, by industry. So this is just outbound investment. Of course, we have inbound investment and minerals and energy are very important there. But um, our outbound foreign direct investment, so this is direct investment, not portfolio investment, which is overall larger because it includes shareholdings. Um, but foreign direct investment, uh, mining makes up 36%. Uh, and we can also see manufacturing, which has a lot of mineral component. I'm thinking of Blue Scope Steel, for example, in the United States, um, is, is a very significant uh, uh, so, uh, destination for investment. 
So mining is the largest FDI sector by a long way for Australia, but not well understood, I, I contend. Just drilling down a little bit, and we've got some, we, we have, do have some, some recent uh, data because ABS and DFAT have now started to collect it. Um, and so in 2018-19, this is, this is mining direct investment. Um, we see that there were 48 Australian listed companies <clears throat> that had overseas affiliates and those overseas affiliates totaled 583, 563, I'm sorry, uh, operating entities in other nations. The equity in those affiliates was worth $137 billion. It's a really substantial uh, investment. And those affiliates employed 59,000 people. Then when we look at the sales, 49 billion purchases by those companies, I I've got of there, it should be by overseas affiliates of $18 billion uh, and profit before tax. We can start to understand how the affiliates of Australian companies are interacting with the host economies in which they're operating in mining. Um, I think it's, it's really uh, worth thinking more about and it's worth drilling down some more to, to better understand what the Australian mining footprint is. So here's one prepared earlier uh, and this is what I had hoped to update. Uh, and the basis is from the uh, S&P um, S &P database. Um, and we see there that in the, in the red circles, we have the number of ASX listed exploration and mining companies and their affiliates operating in each region uh, in 2013. And surprise, it's no surprise that there, are, there were 662 uh, companies operating in Australia, but significant numbers operating offshore. The largest destination by company, um, 206 uh, affiliates in Africa, 94 in Latin America, 105 in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, North and Central Asia, 66, uh, 53 in Europe and 75 in Canada and the United States. The um, ranking in terms of exploration effort of Australia is in the yellow um, or gold squares. And we see that as in 2013, Australia was number one in Africa, uh, number two in Europe, but I hasten to add number one in Scandinavia, um, uh, number two in Latin America, no surprise there, we take second place to, uh, to Canada. Uh, but number three in, um, in North America after Canada and the US and number one in, in the ASEAN region. Um, I'll go then to the METS company. So the percentages uh, in the earth colored uh, circles uh, are based on METS companies identifying key regions as, um, as, as major markets for them. So we see that um, 62%, for example, of Australian mining equipment technology and services companies identify Southeast Asia and Pacific as a primary market. 27% identify Latin America. Finally, uh, the blue circles with the white uh, script uh, is, represent the value of maiden resources discovered between 2008 and 2013 over a five year period by Australian affiliated companies in each of those regions. It's really very substantial and I've summarized it here. Whoops, um, summarized it here. The total uh, value of maiden resources discovered over that five year period by Australian companies is over $2 trillion. So these are in-ground resources, not necessarily recoverable, but a very substantial amount of which well over half of those discoveries were in developing countries, mineral rich developing nations. Uh, and it's, I'm starting, I hope, to paint a picture 
of what's going on with Australian companies offshore. Now, I mentioned Canada a moment ago. Um, Canada has been uh, tracking uh, its global mining industries much more closely than Australia has historically. Uh, Australia is just starting to now. Um, and it views its mining sector as what's going on in Canada, but what Canadian companies are doing abroad as well. Um, and just speaking for my super fund, um, it likes that definition. So moving on to Australia's global mineral responsibilities and opportunities, as I've called them. So Australia um, is for uh, some of its shortfalls, for all of its shortfalls, um, recognised as a leading performer in minerals governance. And this is from the uh, McKinsey Global Institute, a report reverse the curse, maximising the potential of resource-driven economies. Uh, and it found that Australia was in the top five in most of the identified areas of strong performance out of, out of minerals um, endowments. Number six, under fiscal policy and competitiveness, something to do with uh, tax rates um, and uh, or possibly. So, Australia is right up there. Canada is, is, is a bit higher. And, and Norway, of course, in oil and gas is viewed as, as a leader. Now, the, um, this is work done by Alpha Beta for the International Council on Mining and Metals. And I've just, uh, just grabbed one chart from there. Um, if we look at mining dependent country socio socioeconomic performance uh, between 1990 and 2020, um, we see that Australia's right up there, uh, certainly in the top right uh, uh, quartile. Um, but we also see that many of the countries which are either falling behind, but mostly the ones that are catching up, but still below the average performance, Australian companies are active in them, as are Canadian companies, but Australian companies are active in those countries, but they have yet to make the most of their minerals endowment um, through socioeconomic performance. So there is growing impetus for cooperation on mineral govern governance, responsible supply chains and sustainable development for resource-driven or mineral-rich uh, nations in particular. Uh, and uh, the United Nations has called for greater international cooperation on mineral resource governance. And of course, um, UQ and SMI um, uh, recently released with the United Nations Environment Program this report on uh, mineral resource governance and the global goals and agenda for international collaboration. But also last year, the International Energy Agency um, released a report on the minerals requirements for global energy transition. And it called for a new comprehensive approach to mineral security, um, including stronger international collaboration. And by mineral security, they mean um, robust supply chains. They mean sustainable supply chains. They mean responsible resourcing. Um, uh, and the IEA also found, as I'm sure many of you know, that um, new energy sources are actually more minerals intensive than traditional energy uh, generation sources, particularly for electricity. So there is really now a, a real push for stronger collaboration to help lift all of the, the, the nations to much stronger performance and deliver responsibly sourced minerals to enable uh, energy transition, digitization, et cetera. Now, first of a couple of case studies. So uh, Katerina mentioned uh, strengthening ASEAN cooperation in minerals project, which uh, has been running since 2020. We did the last presentation for that at two days ago and launched the public report. 
These are uh, some shots from slides from the ASEAN Secretariat's Energy and Minerals Division, and they summarise the um, focus of the new ASEAN Minerals Cooperation Action Plan, which UQ has advised extensively on. Um, and we see there that uh, sustainable minerals development is a key pillar of the, of the action plan. Uh, and we introduced uh, to ASEAN the concept uh, of policy prospectivity in addition to minerals prospectivity. And they've picked that up, and you can see that in this slide, uh, setting up uh, what ASEAN needs to do to achieve greater policy prospectivity, uh, which includes delivering much more uh, sustainable outcomes from minerals development uh, with a strong emphasis on capacity building in governance. And then on enhancing geological prospectivity, this is uh, a more yeah, well understood concept. Um, uh, well, certainly in, in ASEAN, uh, but as a part of this, SMI has uh, advised on a restructure of the ASEAN Minerals Information System and uh, how ASEAN should be marketing itself for investment, including making uh, sustainable minerals development a key goal in, in, in its dialogues with potential investors. So we'll see how that all now rolls out and how well it is, is implemented um, and what difference it makes to ASEAN's ability to attract exploration investment. It's been losing market share in recent years, uh, but also to, um, to, to deliver much more sustainable outcomes for the people of the 10 nations in ASEAN. Uh, Katerina also mentioned the International Mining for Development Centre uh, and a number of us uh, in the room and online are very proud of the work that that did. That was a UQ, UWA joint venture um, pivoting around SMI. And uh, it did some pretty extraordinary things in, uh, in, in its under four year lifetime. Um, and I think made a real difference uh, in building the capability in developing countries amongst individuals and institutions. And you can see some, some metrics there. There were more than 300 delivery partners in Australia and in uh, host countries. Um, there were 2,726 participants and many of those stayed engaged, more than 1,600 stayed engaged through an online um, platform. Uh, some of the outworkings of that are still going. Uh, UQ is doing a lot of work um, on Australia awards and uh, short courses, and SMI is involved in delivering those that relate to minerals and sustainable development. So Australia has a range of advantages in global mining, and I've just summarised some success factors here. 50 years or well over 50 years of modern mining, broad and deep capabilities um, that are manifest in places like Brisbane and Perth, in particular within clusters where we bring together all of the expertise that's needed from research in comminution uh, through to sustainable minerals development, through to within companies financing um, obviously geology, metallurgy, uh, relating to the people in a village, as well as to the president or minerals minister in, West, in, in a country in West Africa. All of that comes together uh, to create a very competitive situation for Australia, bringing together that expertise. Um, Australia, as I've explained, has a global footprint and a track record across the value chain. Um, it has a leading reputation in mining governance, and that can always be improved um, in part because leading practice is a dynamic concept. Australia has 
had uh, an economic diplomacy strategy uh, with a, a large component being around minerals. Uh, that has somewhat eroded. Uh, it's got an opportunity now to, to, to be picked up again. Um, and more than one foreign minister has noted when they've come back from places like North Africa or Latin America, that they weren't asked for aid dollars. They were asked, how can we get some of Australia's, ex more of Australia's expertise in mining and to build our capacity? And it really impressed the, those foreign ministers when they heard that. Um, and then there are some X factors. I've said here, little geopolitical baggage, perhaps in some regions of the world, like the Pacific, there might be a bit. Um, there is general cultural competence, and we see that Australians um, are reasonably culturally competent wherever they, they are operating and, and quite um, uh, agile. Um, they have that ability to work in diverse cultures and in frontier environments that they have learned in Australia and learned from many years operating overseas. And on, on the right, I've just put a, a, a virtuous circle there of how this is absolutely in the interests of Australia and destination nations. So the stakeholders in minerals development and sustainab sustainability have both differentiated and shared interests. So developing mineral supplier countries, for example, those in ASEAN who we've been working with recently, um, developed mineral supplier and METs and investment countries like Australia and Canada that I've talked about, customer and investor countries such as Germany in particular, the UK and Japan, um, of course, communities and NGOs, uh, very important. And uh, as Daniel Franks and colleagues have, have noted, if you don't get that right, it can cost a lot uh, of money and uh, in terms of um, delay and remediation. Mining and METS companies, of course, and then finally, education, training and capacity building organisations, such as uh, those funders, DFAT, World Bank, GIZ, but also the University of Queensland and, and others around the world. So Australia can position itself at the confluence of those shared interests. I think we, I hope we understand the, op the, the opportunity as well as the obligation. So in conclusion, Australian mining has a global investment and trade footprint right across the value chain. Uh, it has a world leading reputation for governance and for building hopefully lasting value, um, certainly in Australia. Uh, Australian companies, governments and institutions working in partnership can enhance Australia's competitiveness. So its reputation and its competitiveness as a preferred investor in developing nations in particular. So as mining leaders, those companies, governments and institutions such as this one uh, have both a fantastic opportunity building on what's there already, but also I contend a very strong responsibility um, to work with those, those nations and to benefit the globe through sustainable sourcing of minerals, uh, delivering enduring value for the communities and countries that host mineral operations. So with that, I say thank you and uh, invite any, any questions or comments. And yes, do we have any questions or comments in the audience already? Excellent. As we're waiting for them to come in online as well. Uh, thanks, Ian. That was a compelling presentation. Um, you, you make strong arguments, I think, partly because uh, these, this has been an area that you've been invested in for a significant period of time. And maybe also because the arguments make sense. Um, I'm wondering about uh, how to take that argument to, uh, in particular, DFAT and others within the Australian government, 
who were at one time very engaged and convinced of your logic and at other times have been not as engaged. Um, I was, I think most people would be surprised by um, your reflections about Australia outcompeting Canada in terms of global investment in many of the regions uh, and, and projects in many of the regions that Australia operates. Um, I wonder if that's because Canada does invest in international diplomacy capacity building around minerals quite heavily. Um, in particular, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining and Metals, Mining, Minerals and Sustainable Development, I think it is, um, which Australia is not part of, but Canada invests in to capacity build many governments around the world, um, but also Toronto Stock Exchange, PDAC, other, other things. What's your take on where Australia can go next and how do we convince the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade that this is a, uh, a worthwhile investment for them to make? Okay, thank you, uh, Daniel. Touching on, on Canada, uh, it's quite interesting because one of the drivers for Canada to focus much more closely on what its mining companies are doing offshore was not so much the opportunity, more um, some reputation protection because things a, a decade or two ago were going, starting to go wrong environmentally in terms of community relations, um, in terms of dealings, I'll put it this way, dealings with governments that perhaps weren't <coughs> leading practice. Um, and so the Canadian government, that was an initial, as I understand it, an initial driver for the Canadian government to intervene. And it said, amongst others, to, to the Mining Association of Canada, tell your members to fix things up. That's largely you know, a journey they've been on, which is good. And Mining Association of Canada has got its sustainability code, which has been picked up in many, many places, including Australia. Um, and now I think Canada is recognising the, um, the opportunities. Uh, Canada also, um, because in, in part because of things like pension funds, which have a very global focus, thinks a lot more about outward outbound investment, not just in mining, but outbound investment generally. So it's been a long-standing cultural thing that they see outbound investment as a very important part of Canadian economic driver. In Australia, until recently, there's been little attention, much less detailed measurement of our outbound as well as our inbound investment. We know a lot about our inbound investment, um, although there you get some, some xenophobic overtones from some about, about some of that. Um, but until recently, we knew very little really about our outbound investment. And I'm not talking just about mining, I'm talking about many industries, but mining in particular, and this will sort of bring me to that round to DFAT, mining in particular because of reputational issues, because of the capacity for things to go wrong in several ways um, is, a, is a sensitive sector. Um, but it's also Australia's largest offshore investment sector. If we look at portfolio investment, by the way, I should have mentioned this, financial services is actually now larger than mining, that that's including shareholdings. So it's, you know, it's, for example, Macquarie Bank investing in British infrastructure, for example. Um, so we haven't been measuring and therefore we can't we don't understand and much less be able to influence or manage well. So now that we are measuring, and some of that measurement has actually been done by researchers like Jim Redden and myself, um, to just raise, raise the, the profile. It was only a few years ago that um, commentators, including some people in government who should know better, were saying that China is our most important economic partner. No, it's not. It's a, it's a very important trade partner, but when we look at investment, the most important and the, and the composition of trade, particularly in relation to technology and services, the United States is far and away our most important economic partner. And it was only, it's only been a few years since some, some work that was done um, by academics and by um, then subsequently by DFAT has started to, and the US Foreign Service has started to help Australia understand that. So coming back to mining, 
um, within DFAT. So one, DFAT didn't really have good vision of what the global investment profile was. It has much better now uh, across a number of sectors, including mining. Secondly, particularly under the old OSAID, there were some, if you like, cultural issues within government around mining as a vector for development assistance. You kind of, you understand why people who haven't been steeped in mining and leading practice and what it can do in terms of uh, rapid development, um, those people, I think, were quite suspicious of mining and uncomfortable. So mining and mining for development didn't have a lot of friends in government. I'm not making judgment about those, those, those people and the institutions within government. I'm saying that because of lack of understanding of footprint and lack of understanding of the mining process and the moves towards much more sustainable minerals development, there was a lot of suspicion. And so it, it just didn't get a push. Indeed, the International Mining for Development Centre and the uh, overarching Mining for Development initiative was a Rudd government initiative, and it came from the Prime Minister's office. Um, so that's, it, it was a top-down top initiative, worthy, um, and it's done very good stuff, but um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't bottom up because uh, public servants and the institutions thought it was a good idea. A long answer, but uh, it's a complex question. Any other questions in the audience? We do have some questions online. We'll move on, Mark. I'll continue to formulate questions. All right. Um, we have a question um, following on from Daniel's question. There appears to be a deliberate reduction in mineral diplomacy in the Asian region. Following your review, is it partially because of the governance challenges in ASEAN? So just so could you read the first part of that question again, please, Katarina? Uh, there appears to be a deliberate reduction in mineral diplomacy in the Asian region. Um, deliberate reduction in minerals diplomacy from Australia. Okay, I, I'll interpret that as from Australia into ASEAN. Um, but I think there's also a within ASEAN issue. Um, look, the Australian aid budget uh, moving from the last Labor government to the Liberal National Government, um, the Australian aid budget got cut very substantially. And a, a chunk of that um, came out of ASEAN, got pulled completely out of Africa, almost completely out of Africa, uh, completely out of Latin America. Um, and, and this was a positive, a bunch of it got redirected to Pacific. As we've been hearing lately, perhaps not enough um, to, to keep, um, keep, keep the, the attention of some Pacific nations on uh, partnerships with Australia. Um, so I don't know, it was, there was a deliberate, reduction in overall aid. And um, of course, min minerals related capacity building came under pressure. It did not stop, uh, as I mentioned earlier, UQ for example, and other universities have been delivering uh, Australia Awards um, short courses around mineral governance uh, over, over the period, but it's just not as intense as it, as it was. The World Bank also has been doing stuff with Australian, Australian funding and the project we've been working on for the last 18 months um, was funded by Australia. So in another way, it went, it went below, beneath the radar. But looking at ASEAN nations as well, because, because minerals development has been problematic in some of those ASEAN countries, and we all know about the Philippines, where even the Roman Catholic Church came out against mining and particularly open, open cut mining in the Philippines. Um, and in response, government put a ban on it. That's now being unwound. Um, but there are issues in a number of countries about minerals, 
perhaps a lack of understanding within ASEAN nations about the difference, that the economic difference that a quality minerals industry can make. Um, the stronger understanding now, because most of those nations are looking for quicker wins in terms of revenue and economic development post pandemic. Um, like this ASEAN project got going before before that, but we're hearing from nations like you know Cambodia, Laos, um, and others that yeah the the and Philippines in particular that post pandemic they're looking for minerals to take a much stronger role uh, in their nations. And I um, would suggest you also have a look at uh, at some of the new minerals policies in Malaysia. It looks awfully like global leading practice. Um, so. So that's good. So I think it's it's turning around and, and if the ASEAN Minerals Cooperation Action Plan is implemented as we hope it will be, it should make a real difference. We actually have another question that is sort of even more elaboration on what you've just said. So how confident are you that AMS will make the necessary policy and regulatory changes to turn this around? So AMS, ASEAN Member States, I should also say that it's from Paul Rogers, the question. <laughs> and I feel like he also stole the question from my mouth. I was gonna ask very similar. Well, thank you. And that's thank because you. we've all worked together thank on you, this Paul, Asian project. Thank you, Paul, another member of the, uh, the, the, the uh, UQ ASEAN Minerals team. And get well soon, Paul. Um, I think that's a, that's, that's a big question. Um, and it was one that was implicit in the a launch seminar on Wednesday uh, around AMCAP and the work we had done. Um, look, there are 10 ASEAN nations. They range from highly developed nation states, Singapore, uh, through to um, fairly early stage developing nations. Um, Cambodia, you know, within our lifetimes, so former, formerly you know, war-torn uh, failed state. Uh, so there's differences in capacities um, and there are differences in history. And I've talked about the Philippines. Um, with the, the big um, inhibitor, or the two big inhibitors, one is the lack of understanding at high level of government at, at the difference that a well-governed mineral sector, given a certain level of minerals endowment, can make to an economy and to society. Um, and so, first of all, you need the, that understanding at you know, president or prime minister level. I think that's starting to, to change. We're seeing those policies talked about and, and in advising ASEAN, we were saying you really need to make sure that minerals are mainstreamed and talked about. Uh, the second big issue is the capacity of the bureaucracy the institutions and the individuals within those bureaucracies to uh, administer good governance. It's not their fault, they lack capacity, they even just lack the number of trained people. Um, and we've, a number of us have interacted with them over the years. Um, and in Laos, for example, they take a very pragmatic approach. They're actually not issuing any more exploration licenses until government can be assured that the current bureaucratic capability can ad adequately administer the ones they've already got. Mm. Very pragmatic approach. They just, they just don't want to have things going wrong. So they put a, a freeze on, on new exploration licenses and building capability. And I know that Germany is one of the countries that's working with Lao to, to help build that up. So I'm confident with effort by a commitment by those nations effort by those nations and their development partners, which can include Australia, Germany, uh, Daniel mentioned the Intergovernmental Forum uh, and others um, that we can lift up, but it's going to take you know, a commitment and collaboration. Um, but the platform's been created now. Let's, let's see how we can implement. Excellent formulated? I don't think it's formulated, it's more an, an observation. So if you look at the data that you've presented 
you get a number of really interesting narratives coming through. And I suppose it's mainly because I'm busy working on with the team here, sort of what our five and 10 year vision should be for the Institute. And that always starts, well, what do we think that future is gonna look like? So when you're having a look at it, um, Australia has incredible opportunity to really be that global leader in the mining space because of all the, the components that are there. So you may, other countries may lead in particular areas, but if you put it all together, all the pieces are there to, to really lead both locally and internationally. So fantastic opportunity. You then step into the education sector, which Australia is also leading and has some of the top universities in the world and develop some of the top technologies that you need to be able to achieve all these components. So really, really competitive advantage there or something really special. What's interesting for me is just how little that is celebrated, recognized and supported. And yet that could be the winning recipe to actually unlock a future opportunities or a future that we all, we all strive to achieve. So I'm really interested in, so what's stopping it happening? I cannot believe really clever people don't look at the same data and go, well, it's obvious. This is what we need to go and do. And why then we don't go and do it. And then the next piece of data that comes out is, if you have a look at where those minerals are, they are in developing countries. You have to put the infrastructure and the capacity in that to mine well to be able to do well from mining. So you've got to get the governance in place. So it just really astounds me that there isn't a massive focus on Australia doing that, and maybe in partnership with Canada, because I think I think Canada's woken up to this. I, I just get the sense Canada said, well, this is a big opportunity for the country, not just for individual parts of the country. So I'd be interested to know what you think the big barriers are for Australia stepping up into that leadership role. Yeah, look, very pertinent um, and so I see observation, Neville. Um, well, I think the first barrier has been, but is evaporating now, and that's lack of understanding because we just haven't been measuring. And now we understand better how important mining is in our international investment portfolio. Um, and where our miners are, are operating, but we need better, even better data on that and, and real-time data to better understand that. Natural Resources Canada collects it annually for their, for their, for their companies. Anyway, that's a, that's a work in progress and that's a good thing. I think there's also in political and policy debate, and it's an anomaly and, and it kind of goes to what you highlighted. For such a trade and investment exposed nation, we have so often a more mercantilist mindset. Your gain is my loss. Think Donald Trump. Um, and I just don't understand that. Why, why would we as a trading nation and a nation that's very dependent on inward investment and now a nation that is a global investor in mining and financial services and manufacturing um, and other, other sectors, why we haven't twigged, which goes to the question that, that you asked. I think in part it's cultural. I've sat in um, meetings of the Committee for the Economic Development of Australia in forums where Australian business leaders have stood up and just amazingly bemoaned the fact that our businesses were going offshore. Now, if that means call centres somewhere else or shifting manufacturing operations, that's one thing. But the fact that our mining industry is going offshore and our financial services industry is going offshore and manufacturers like Blue Scope are doing really well offshore you know, this goes right back, I've come right round in a circle, Neville, to ask the same question. Why aren't we celebrating that? And I think it goes to impart that anomalous lack of understanding of you know, what trade and investment makes up. And, you know, there needs to be some, perhaps some more research and some more socialisation to, to better, better understand that. In the current election climate, um, I won't name 
candidates or parties, but we've got one not mainstream party saying we're going to haul back, we want to haul back um, uh, superannuation investments um, into Australia and make them invest in Australia. Well, if you did that in Canada, you'd reduce pension funds dramatically because <laughs> they're investing big time in, a, in Australia and elsewhere. So I haven't answered your question, but I've, if, in, a, in a way, posed it in another way and perhaps given a few clues. But I think it's something that we, as people who understand this, the mineral sector um, should be talking more about it. We did pitch this, I have to say, to the Minerals Council of Australia some years ago, maybe five or six years ago, that you need, MCA, you need to be thinking about the Australian minerals industry in the way that Canada does. And my understanding is they then inquired of their board and the answer came back, no, we're better off focusing on policy issues in Australia. I can kind of understand that. They've got a lot of policy issues to deal with. Um, and this was just after the super profits tax campaign. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to see the industry talking more about it, as MAC, Mining Association of Canada, does. We've got, we don't have um, questions, but we've got a couple of comments on, um, online to a few things that you've said, and they come from John Shepard. So he mentions that Lao has in fact lifted their moratorium at the end of 2020, but it issued a number of concessions during the moratorium, particularly for rare earth. And then the Australia awards emphasis for the last few years has had a focus on the soft sciences and has not included trade, including mining. Um, if you wanted to comment on that. I, or I just comment on Lao. Yes, yep. uh, John's right. Uh, Lao did lift the moratorium, but the detailed direction underneath that hasn't been issued for the president's office to the requisite public servants. So they're not actually um, acting on it. And in part because of some of those concessions that were issued, there's some, I don't know, some, some, some issues, but we've been talking to the, to the Lao senior officials. And so they haven't had any instruction on how they're to do this. Um, and so they're still very focused on uh, administering the tenements that they've got. Uh, as well as being focused on building capacity, which Germany's uh, the uh, prime uh, prime aid donor for. Uh, in terms of Australia awards, quite possibly, I haven't been tracking them in detail. I'm, I'm aware of some of the short courses that UQ has been uh, running and a couple of other universities. Um, but if that's true, that's a pity because when you ask many of these mineral and resource rich developing countries what their capacity building priorities are, it, it's, it's how we make the most of our natural endowments. And coming out the other side of the pandemic, um, from talking with all of the 10 ASEAN countries, you know, they've given uh, resources uh, an even greater emphasis because of potential for reasonable speed to market and revenue and economic stimulus. And apologies, Rick, uh, just seeing your hand up. So yes, please go ahead and ask your question. Oh, uh, oops. Am I on mute? No, I'm not on mute, good. Um, can, can you, you hear me? You? Yeah, yep. good. Yes. Um, th thanks, Ian, that was a great talk. Um, first, first thing I want to say was I'd love to help update that 2013 ASX Explorer snapshot. Um, um, that'd be, I think it'd be a really good thing to do. And it's important because obviously mining or you know, small exploration companies are are the first impression a lot of the time. Um, but my question is, how much better off would we be if those exploration companies themselves, like how much more in positive impact in the development and investment area would we have if those companies themselves made improvements to the way they do business? And an example that comes to mind is that when you look at all those ASX listed companies. And I actually last year had a look at all of the junior exploration companies on the planet, which in the S&P came out to be about 1,060. And there were 15 female CEOs, three on the ASX. Um, so, you know, the, so, yeah, the question is, though, you know, what, what, what do you think, um, what impact would 
um, improvement of our mining and exploration companies make? Um, Rick, a very pertinent question. Thank you. And um, we'll, we'll talk offline about updating those numbers because last time Jim Redden and I did a report, um, we actually published it through the Centre for Exploration Targeting, not for want of asking another organisation that uh, <laughs> I'm standing in right now. Um, look, improving the performance of those exploration juniors in particular is vital. I mean, even we, we see better performance from larger companies because they've got uh, defence in depth, but then we also th see things going horribly wrong technically uh, and in terms of uh, uh, management and uh, uh, community interaction. Um, while Australians culturally have good skills, it seems, to be working in, I use the example of West Africa, or Peru or Chile or Mongolia, um, there's obviously still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, you mentioned the lack of women on the boards of these companies. Very important, the conservative think tank, the Peterson Institute in the United States a few years ago actually did a study of thousands of global companies. And they actually found that those companies that had significant numbers of women in the C-suite, so the, the CEO, CFO, COO role, or on boards and or on boards, performed better financially. They got better outcomes for their shareholders. Mining, of course, has been male dominated. That's changing, um, but there is a need uh, in the interests of shareholders to bring forward more women, but I think also I would like to see the organisations like um, AMEC, Association of Mining and Exploration Companies, the Australia and Africa Mining Industry Group, another one, um, strengthen up the guidelines that they have, uh, develop guidelines or codes of practice, uh, do capacity building within the industry after understanding what difference that can make. And Daniel, uh, what was the paper, Daniel, you did some years ago where you looked at the cost of getting it wrong um, with communities? The cost of conflict. Yeah, the cost of conflict. Yeah, so that, that, that paper pointed out just how much it can cost a mining, a mining company and a nation for getting, for getting things wrong. So there's a really good business case, I would think, for those exploration companies, which are sometimes pretty hand to mouth, um, but are operating and doing a pretty good technical job and to a, to a point, pretty good community relations and government relations job in some far flung places, but they can do a lot better. And that's another part of the, of, of, of the, the puzzle, I think, uh, you, you, that you've pointed out. Um, so, uh, yeah, we should, we should, again, talk some more about, about that. But I think first we need to make the business case to these companies. And when we established the Mining for Development Centre, which was a you know, government initiative that was uh, picked up then by UQ and UWA and before it spread out to others, um, at that time, the Australia Africa Mining Industry Group couldn't actually see the business case. As we went on, they could see the business case and mining companies were actually asking if they could send people to some of our courses uh, and they were in, encouraging their chambers of mines, who we, which we treated as NGOs, because they're very important two-way organisations, they're not just mining industry PR machines. Um, we started taking some of those people because it was less complicated in terms of governance. Although we did have some mining company people to mining leadership, short courses fully funded by those mining companies. Anyway, there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of benefit for the industry to grab hold of this as well. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Uh, probably um, time to, to wrap up. 
Um, so thank you for such an insightful presentation and a great discussion. Next week, we have Dr. Mehdi Serati from the School of Civil Engineering here at UQ. Um, unfortunately, we still don't have a title for the presentation, but we will have it sorted early in the week and we will see you all then. Thank you.